Hi, this is Coach MJ. Welcome back to the Real Mission I'm Possible show. Today, we have an American who has migrated from, well, Nigeria, his family originally comes from. And so he came here uh, and settled down to one of the most easy states to deal with in the whole country, Texas. And as a Texan, he decided he was going to play sports because that's what Texans do. And he became a runner and then a football player. He's then got, gone to the Naval Academy. He's ascended into uh, becoming a lieutenant commander in the Navy. So thank you for your service, sir. And moreover, he's become a very famous race car driver in NASCAR, which is the last thing you'd expect anybody from Nigeria to jump into. So without further ado, I'd like to invite Mr. Jesse Wuji, Lieutenant Commander, sir. Thank you for your service. Thank you. Thank you for having me on the show. So first of all, uh, I've, I've looked into your background. It's so impressive and inspirational, I have to say. And I've listened to um, you talk in several other uh, events and shows, and you you are just awe-inspiring. You've got that great gun-ho attitude. And what I wanted to do in the show today, because you know, we're Mission Impossible, which means that my listeners, thankfully, are able to get inspiration for pe from people just like yourself who have gone through sometimes absolute mayhem to get to where they're at right now. Um, could you give us just a little bit, not the, not the pretty, fairy, beautiful story, but some of the struggles that you faced as a young man and then throughout your journey? Yeah, 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 definitely. So, uh, you know, throughout my journey, definitely have gone through a lot of different struggles to go from Navy to NASCAR. Um, there really isn't an easy path uh, going from Navy to NASCAR. Most race car drivers, uh, when they start racing, they start at age five, six, seven, eight years old. From there, they work their way up from go-karts to uh, Legends cars to late models to uh, ARCA to the National Series of NASCAR and so on. Um, that's kind of the general path right there. And most of those folks who do it, their parents have some type of money because it costs money to go racing. Racing isn't like any other stick and ball sport like football or basketball or anything like that or soccer. If I want to uh, get good at basketball, I can go to the store, get a basketball, go outside, go play at the uh, at the court in the neighborhood or go to the YMCA or go to L.A. Fitness or whatever it is. And you can play basketball against people, get better and better, better work on your skills, all for the price of maybe a gym membership and, uh, you know, basketball. <laughs> that's about it. You don't even have to buy one. You just go there. and There's probably one there already. You can use somebody else's. But that's the price of admission to get into a sport like that whereas for racing the price of admission is you got to go buy go-karts or race cars you got to get trailers you got to haul the stuff you got to pay for travel um tires fuel people mechanics uh parts breaking crashed cars all that stuff you got to spend a lot of money on that stuff throughout your racing career to get to where you want to go there's a lot of kids out there who for, between the ages of six and 18 they spend, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars, sometimes even up to a million or millions uh, by the time they get to 18 on their racing career just to get it to that point. When I was a, a kid, I didn't have that kind of money. My parents didn't have that kind of money. They were immigrants from Nigeria coming to the U.S. with absolutely nothing. My mom, she was really, really poor in Nigeria, and she used to fetch fruits off of trees uh, it would climb up these trees, pull fruits off of them and take them to the market to sell just to make an extra dollar for her family. And she used to have to fetch water from local rivers and streams near her after school just to help the family have extra water and extra cleaning water, extra uh, cooking water. You named it. And she did that at age 11, 12, 13 years old in middle school. Right. I don't know how many middle schoolers in this country are willing to go to the river, fetch water and bring it back for the family just so they can have some water to cook clean and 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 and. You know, survive. But that's what she came from. My dad, you know, he came from a family that was, he had like 10 other siblings. It was like 11 kids in the household, in a very small house in the jungle in Nigeria. They had an outhouse for a restroom. They didn't have running water. Electricity worked here or there. Like that's where they came from. And they brought the, the hardworking type mentality from there here to the US and instilled it in me and my brothers and my sisters. And we knew that. As we were growing up and as we were going to go reach our, our, our absolute top of what we're supposed to become, uh, they instilled this hardworking ethic in us so that we would not take anything for granted and then we would put 
full 100% effort into everything we did. So as I was growing up, you know, getting into football, which is the first sport I got into, I wasn't good at first. Uh, I made the B team the first year and the second year in, in seventh and eighth grade. And I was about to make the B team again going into ninth grade, but I picked up a prayer book and started make, uh, praying like every single day. I started doing things outside of football to help myself become better. I was uh, working out extra every single day. I was doing 100 push-ups every day. I was doing 100 calf raisers, 100 sit-ups. I was doing all these different things to get better and better because I wasn't good at first. I was getting a football and throwing it up and catching it by myself just to get better at catching the football. I was doing all these things so that eventually I could make the A team. And in that ninth grade year, I made the A team. The very next year, in uh, my sophomore year, uh, I was on the JV team starting and I was doing well. And I was, I was catching passes instead of dropping them. I was scoring touchdowns. I was making tackles. I was getting interceptions. And then going off to 11th grade and 12th grade, doing the same thing, getting better and better. All the people who had natural talent, who were better than me to begin with, I ended up surpassing them. And getting myself to a point where all of a sudden when the schools were, the colleges were coming in to recruit, they were recruiting me and not these folks who had been sitting on the sideline, basically not doing anything. They thought that they had natural skills that could just get them through wherever they wanted to go to in life. And natural ability doesn't take you that far. It might open a door, but it doesn't keep you in a room. Hard work, good effort, and just being an overall good steward, <laughs> good person. Um, that's what's going to not only get you in a room, but keep you in a room. Your and that's parents, what happened for me. Your parents instilled this in you. Exactly. You know, we, we have something in America. We say, well, eat all your food. Don't you know that people are starving in Africa? And boy, your yeah, parents yeah. knew that for real. Oh, yeah, they they were. They were the ones starving in Africa and they yeah. got over here. So yeah. uh, worked really hard. Eventually got recruited by the Naval Academy, uh, decided that it was going to be a great opportunity to go to a good school, get a great education, um, got to the Naval Academy. Once again, I had to fight for everything I had there, wow. right? Um, you know, the Naval Academy is a type of place where they teach you how to be as resourceful as possible. They'll give you a little bit of information. They'll give you a little bit of resources, but they say, hey, you got to go climb a mountain now with the little that we've given you. And you learn from that so that when you go to whatever obstacles, through whatever obstacles you go through in life, you are able to go in with a little and come out with a lot. And that's what the Naval Academy prepares you for. I learned that throughout the Naval Academy. I ended up playing football there all four years, started in multiple games, played in a lot of big games, had a lot of winning seasons, did all that fun stuff. Graduated in 2010 and became an officer uh, in the Navy, and I was on the ships. And while on the ships, I was deploying, going to the Middle East, going to all these different places. And uh, during that time, when I would have any kind of off time, when I came back from deployments, I was starting to develop this passion for cars and racing. And that passion uh, led me towards eventually wanting to become a professional race car driver. Where did uh, that come from, Jesse? Whoa, 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 whoa. whoa! I got I got the football, the Naval Academy, and you're on the ships. But whoa, 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 whoa! Where did the, where did the cars come from? <laughs> well, when I was a kid, when I was like five or six years old, I used to watch the show Night Rider with David Hasselhoff. Okay, and uh, when I watched it at that age, for whatever reason, cars and all that just kind of stuck with me and I started developing this passion for cars and I had always liked cars and racing throughout my life, but never got into it because once again, it was just, I, there was no path that I saw to get there. Right. I just saw the path of football and that's what I was going to do. But now that I graduated from the Naval Academy and football was over for me, I needed that next exciting thing to get into. So I thought I'm like, Hey, I finally have a little bit of money now. I'm an officer in the Navy. You know, I can pay for this, but why don't I just, you know, get some sports cars and, and take them to tracks and do uh, these uh, car enthusiast type track days where anybody can bring their vehicle on track. So I was doing that. Um, in 2011, 2013, 2014. And after a few years of doing that, eventually one day I was just sitting in a room and just made this crazy decision that I wanted to go after pro racing. And I didn't know uh, really kind of what direction to go, how to make it happen. But the one thing I did learn from the Naval Academy was once again, how to be resourceful and how to basically take a little bit and make a lot out of it. So I uh, used my research skills to start researching and putting together in a way, kind of like a business plan on how to get into racing. And then I started following these different steps that I put together. I started researching, I started gathering information. I started finding money. I started creating money from starting my own small business. I was doing all these different things to create what was necessary to be able to go the long distance, to go the distance and get into where I wanted to go. And uh, through a lot of grind, through a lot of effort and a lot of faith, was able to slowly put all this together and basically get myself into lower levels of racing, like uh, racing late model stock cars 
and then from there moving up to like the arca series uh the nascar truck series now the nascar xfinity series and um it's been a crazy journey to get there a lot of uh, tough battles throughout that whole time i mean many times where i ran out of resources ran out of money ran out of contacts ran out of this ran out of that but just never quit just continue to push forward no matter what knowing that the very next day you never know who's going to walk through the door who's going to call who's going to email what's going to happen that's going to all of a sudden extend my runway and continue to allow me to go down this journey you are a movie you are a movie. I mean, I saw, I saw like the Bobcat. What was the bobsled team in Jamaica? Yeah, yeah, he, yeah. <laughs> he surpassed it already, and now you've got a business with NFL Hall of Famer Emmett Smith. What did you say to him to get him to put his money in there? Yeah, yeah. So, uh, you know, talking with Emmett, Emmett's uh, been the type of person ever since, you know, he's been done with his football career. He's been looking to uh, create these different legacies, create these different, um, in a way, systems, right? Opportunity generating systems where we can create something that can build uh, not only us, but build people around us, build, build people that we bring in, build them up, make them better than what they came in as, and then be able to uh, basically allow for them to open up op- or allow opportunities to open up for them, um, whether it's with us or other places, you name it. And uh, the only way to do it is to have a, the right platform. Um, and that right platform was by starting our own race team. So 2022, we debuted our NASCAR team together and uh, ran all of last year. Um, we had a lot of ups and downs, went through all different kind of things because that's what happens in small businesses. You know, you're an entrepreneur, you know, you start a business, you have good days and you have bad days, but we always continue to fight through everything, got through it all and was able to execute uh, all year long. Now we're going into 2023 and we look forward to having a great year again this year. So I've, I've been trying to follow your story ever since you started talking. Uh, one, you didn't take a breath when you were talking. Two, <laughs> I don't think you took a day off. You never rested on your laurels, and you're always looking for the next big thing, which I just think is incredible. I know so many entrepreneurs, including myself, who maybe had a, a something in their mind. They they hit the pinnacle, they hit the mountain, and they didn't take that next step to go for the next hill. They might have just coasted for a while, and you don't mm-hmm. seem you like you the type of individual that you've done that. I very much would like to hear you narrate, if you would, please, your own take on visualization and your own experiences on affirmations, visualization, and dream boards. Yeah. um, Visualizations, affirmations, all that stuff is very, very important, especially the visualized part, right? Um, I always tell people, when you have a big goal, big dream, there's some place you want to go, a destination you want to get to, something you want to achieve. It all starts in your mind. You have to clearly see, you have to clearly visualize yourself achieving whatever that is. And it has to be something that I always tell people it has to be God given. It can't be just some random stuff you just make up uh, on any instance. Like when I was sitting in my room and I had this vision of myself becoming a race car driver, I just wasn't sitting there and just, just randomly made up some thought. It came to me. This is something that came to me multiple, multiple times. And finally, while sitting there in a room, it hit me again. And I was like, I think this is what I'm supposed to do. Like, this just keeps coming to me over and over and over. And I just kept seeing myself walking out through driver intro, seeing the fans, seeing the crowd, everybody waving, cheering, all that stuff. Incredible. Getting ready to Incredible. Hop into a race car. I saw Unbelievable. it. You Unbelievable. Know? And, and, of course, you know, amazing story again. And so you get downstairs and you go, Ma, I had this vision. I'm going to be a race car driver. How does that go over? <laughs> well, when I called her and told her that, uh, she, my parents didn't really understand why I wanted to do it because no one in the family had ever gone down the path of motorsports. So it wasn't a thing in Nigeria, right? The only racing we do in Nigeria is foot racing. So uh, that wasn't going to be a thing or that wasn't a thing that was normal for us. But um, they knew that if I did put my mind towards something that I could actually go and achieve it. So they didn't try to stop me. Um, they tried to steer me a few times to say, hey, you know, maybe, maybe do this. Hey, you're, you look like you're pretty good with business stuff. Why don't you just kind of just go the business route? This and that. I like that. No, I'm going to race. <laughs> I saw it. I'm going to achieve it. Wow. That's just terrific. And I'm, I'm so blessed to have finally had the opportunity to speak to you and hear you and see you. Uh, I, I feel like uh, I've just been through uh, an incredible, entertaining and riveting show because you have inspired me. Uh, to to look at the way that I do things and other people do things because you've taken it. You said a step by step program that you created 
in order to be able to find money, get money, make money on your own, and attract money. Could you take us a little bit through your system? Yeah, yeah. So uh, basically what I did was I knew that, hey, uh, to to race, it costs money. Um, some people say, hey, just go find sponsors. Like, it's just that easy, right? And it's not that easy. I, I maybe shot emails over to 500, 600, 700 people and got no's from everybody that actually answered. And then from there, I was like, okay, I'm not going to let that be the determining factor on why I'm not going to get into racing. Uh, if they're not going to sponsor me, I'm just going to go sponsor myself. So I decided to start my own small business, and that business was hosting drag racing events at drag strips. So I was basically using my social media skills to hype up this event. I was using my social media skills to invite a whole bunch of people. Uh, they would pay spectator fees, racing fees, uh, pit crew fees, you name it, pay all these different fees to get into the event. And any extra profit I made after the expenses was what I was going to use to basically sponsor myself to uh, continue my path in racing. And it worked. Uh, first year, I probably profited maybe fifty thousand uh, dollars. The next year, I profited like a hundred plus thousand dollars. So that was enough at that time to sponsor what I was doing in racing. Uh, today, that kind of money maybe gets me one race, <laughs> but not, back then it got me a lot of races. And and how does this work in tandem? I'm just curious, and a lot of the listeners don't know this. How does it work in tandem? Because you're currently a lieutenant commander in the Navy. You're a naval officer, correct? Yeah, yeah. So currently right now, Lieutenant Commander in the U.S. Navy Reserves. I was active duty from 2010 to 2017. I've been in the reserves from 2017 through now, almost five years now, actually almost uh, six years now. And, uh, you know, I, right now as a reservist, I do one weekend a month and two weeks a year. So on the weekends that I do have races as well, I got to figure out basically how to reschedule my drills so that I'm not missing a lot of drills. And I can still basically do all the things I'm supposed to do in the Navy while still doing what I'm supposed to do in the racing world and the business world and so on. Outstanding. And have you thought about contacting people like Richard Branson and Jeff Bezos? These guys will have these space programs because, <laughs> I mean, for you, the sky's never been the limit anyway. Why not have them come on as sponsors and get to the stars? You know, if I can find a way to get to them, I, I, I will definitely run that by them. <laughs> yeah, if you're listening, Richard, if you're Sir Richard, if you're listening, <laughs> fantastic. And could you just uh, give a quick shout out to any any young person uh, who might be or anyone who might be in a place in their life where they go, gosh, everything just looks like it's impossible to do. Uh, I can't do this. I've had this problem happen to me. This problem happened to me. He's just lucky. What could you say to them to to help them lift themselves out of the out of the bog and up the ladder that they could create themselves? Yeah. Um, in life, there really is no such thing as luck. Like luck is not a thing. It's not, it's nothing. It's actually, it's not, it's not a thing. There is no such thing as luck. What gets people places is that they are following their visualizations. They have clearly visualized themselves accomplishing something. After they visualize it, they put action towards it every single day. They don't put action just like once a week or once a month. They put action on a daily basis towards it. They're trying to figure out some way to get closer and closer to their goals and dreams. As they're putting action, that's when they start seeing the darkness, right? The tunnel that they're starting to go through, the journey that they're taking because they're taking steps, it gets very, very dark. It gets very cold. The deeper you go in that tunnel, the darker it's going to get, the colder it's going to get. You're going to start tripping. You're start falling. It might be wet. You might have snakes in there. You might have lions bears tigers spiders you might have people trying to stab you in the back you might have all these things happening along that tunnel but at the end of the day it's still going to hurt to go all the way back because when you go back you got to go right back through all the crap that you went through except maybe they're not stabbing you or kicking you or hitting you maybe they're just laughing at you all the way back so why not continue to push forward it's going to hurt the same right and keep going as again darker and darker and darker understand that even in the darkest point of the night the sun will still rise so at some point the light of the tunnel will will shine. You will see the light at the end of the tunnel. It might not. You might not see it until you're about an inch away. But just know that it is still there. Just because you can't see it, this is where the faith comes into play. Where you have that faith in God, knowing that hey, like no matter what I can't see, I know it's still there. And you have faith that if you're no matter what, as long, long as you continue to put action towards it, you will achieve it. You just remember those things right there. You can achieve whatever you're supposed to achieve. That's amazing. And just as a takeaway on leadership, because you, as a, as a lieutenant commander, obviously you have people who follow you within your career. 
So what's your what's your biggest takeaway on leadership? What kind of leader do you, are you attracted to? You know, as far as leadership, you know, the leaders I'm attracted to are the ones that empower their people, um, empower them to become greater than what they were, what they think they can be, right? Who brings the best out of them, who understands them, who seeks to understand their people, but once seeking to understand helps empower them to level up to the highest level that they can possibly get to. That's a great leader right there. Jesse Awuji, we're so lucky to have had you today. And thank you so much. And I look forward to seeing you win race after race and go after even more than you were talked about today. It's been fantastic having you on the Real Mission I Am Possible show. Thank you, sir. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much for having me. And I'll be happy to put your sp uh, sponsor links uh, here on the, on the channel. So if anybody wants to get in and find out more about you and follow your journey and see how they can get involved in some of your business, well, then uh, they can do that too. Sounds good. Awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir. Thank you.